we'll go ahead and um, and talk about our or introduce our lunch month. I'm sorry, lunch speaker today. On January the 14th, 2013, Chris Coster was sworn in for a second term as the 41st Attorney General of the State of Missouri. As Attorney General, Mr. Coster created a domestic violence task force, which led to comprehensive new laws to protect domestic violence survivors, recovered a record $200 million to the state's health care system, from fraudulent Medicaid providers, cracked down on violations of workers' rights, and aggressively protected Missouri consumers against fraud, including mortgage relief and debt settlement scams. He supported the law enforcement in fighting the spread of methamphetamine and violent crime. Prior to being elected as Attorney General, Mr. Coster served in the Missouri Senate from 2004 to 2008, representing Cass, Johnson, Bates, and Vernon Counties. He previously served as Cass County Prosecuting Attorney for 10 years. Mr. Coster was born and raised in St. Louis. He is a graduate of the University of Missouri and the University of Missouri School of Law. He also earned a Master's in Business Administration from Washington University in St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming Attorney General, General Coster. I appreciate the introduction. Chris Turnbull and I worked together um, in Cass County for many of those years. I, when you said I was in Cass County prosecutor for 10 years, I felt Chris in his head going, 10 long years. <laughs> he had to put up with me. One of the things I want you to know about your Attorney General uh, is that I worked in this community, broadly speaking, for 16 years. And so you'll forgive me for growing up with St. Louis and but uh, it is, it's a, a tremendous educational benefit that I, that I got to spend 10, you know, 16 years here. Two years at Blackwell Sanders, which is now Hush Blackwell, the big law firm downtown. 10 years as Cass County Prosecutor, and then four years in the Missouri State Senate representing broadly these issues in this area during a time, 2004 to 2008, when a lot of the important issues that affected us as a region, not to mention the least of which was the debates over stem cell research. It all occurred in, in 2005 and 2006 in the interaction with the Stowers Institute. And that all uh, uh, greatly impacted my own personal life because it caused me to leave the majority party and go to the minority party. Uh, and so it's the fact that I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I worked here and know this community. Uh, as well as a, an outsider can you know it, I suppose, for, um, through these, this time period. So thank you for the invitation to come and talk with you. This is a very cool room. I've never been in this room. Um, so it's a, I'm going to get a look at the center by the time before we leave. It's a very nice meeting room. Let me tell you a little bit about what I do, and then we'll talk about some of the issues that the state faces, and then open it up for questions and answers. So the, the, the term Attorney General is kind of an opaque term. It sounds political and it's not absolutely revealing of what the job actually is. But everybody in the business community knows what the job is. I'm the general counsel for the state of Missouri. And I run the largest general counsel's office in the state, public or private. I have 400 people that I work with. We, are, we exist in five different cities, Jefferson City, St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield, and Cape Girardeau is where those 400 individuals are spread out through. It is the largest general counsel office, either public or private. There's no private company that has a 400 person general counsel office in the state. And we are attached to this corporation. It's a public corporation. You are the shareholders of it. There's six million shareholders here in the state. You're among the six million shareholders. So you are my bosses. The corporation that we are all part of, all owners of, is, it's a pretty big corporation. It's about $27 billion in revenue. So if it was on the Fortune 100 list, if it was a private corporation, it would be the 100th largest entity in the country. 
about the size of Emerson Electric in, in St. Louis. They have 65,000 employees. It's about the size of Enterprise Leasing, one of the largest employers in the country. Of course, Enterprise's employees are all through North America and all through the hemisphere, really. All of our 65,000 employees are right here within the borders of the state of Missouri. My clients, uh, most directly speaking, are a wonderful group. I have the governor, the 16 cabinet departments, the legislature, and you are uh, my clients as well. Um, but unlike a corporation that does one thing really well, like sell beer, make greeting cards, or rent cars, we are involved in every aspect, our corporation is involved in every aspect of human life. We ensure the health care of 800,000 of our fellow citizens through the state's Medicaid program. At the other end of the pendulum, we incarcerate 30,000 of our fellow citizens in the Department of Corrections. We manage and fund and have built 13 four-year universities, 13 four-year universities, 20 community colleges, 600 school districts, 650 or so police departments. Uh, we regulate agriculture and banking and insurance in this state. We regulate the use of land through the uh, Department of Natural Resources. We promote economic development. And those are just a few of the things that this corporation does. So it, it, it is vast, vast in its reach. Now like any corporation that is as diverse and complicated as this, you would hope that we have would have a board of directors that is highly educated, highly experienced, tightly knit, and cooperative. We have the General Assembly, <laughs> of which we have two of our laudatory members here today, Bud Ammons and Tom McDonald, who do a great job. But the legislature is a very awkward way to govern such a vast and complicated corporation. We were broken into two political parties that have perfected the art of fighting and disagreeing. And then we have made a decision we have to accept responsibility of this. We have made a decision as the six million shareholders of the corporation that every eight years we're going to take all of the members of the board of directors and we're going to toss them out on their ears. Because surely no one who has spent more than eight years governing this complicated entity, no one who has spent more than eight years governing this complicated entity could possibly be better than somebody who's never done it. So we're going to go back to experience. And I, I, I asked people the question, would you ever take your retirement savings and invest it in a company that threw out its board of directors every eight years? Would you want the, your investment uh, income, your retirement savings invested in such an entity? Someday I hope we go back and review that decision uh, and decide whether that was a wise decision. But I love being general counsel of this entity. I absolutely love it. I was first taken by the, the job when I was 24 years old. I, I knew nothing about political life. I had no desire to be in politics when I was young, never in city council or anything like that. It hit me later. And I was a first year law student uh, at Washington University then and had an opportunity to intern at the Attorney General's office. And your Attorney General's office has a really remarkable history to it. One that if you don't know about it, I want you to know about it, because it belongs to you. And, you know, I, I was inspired by it when I was a young student. So I was interning at the office, and you learn the stories of the history of this place. And let me just tell you one. So my office that I now have the good fortune of uh, sitting in, I'm talking about the geographic space that I sit in, is in the northeast corner of the Missouri Supreme Court building. It's the big red brick building right across from the state capitol. Northeast corner. As you go from my office back toward the Deputy Attorney General's office, so my number two, um, 
you will walk down a hallway that's about 70 feet long. And in that hallway, from the southeast corner, from the northeast corner to the southeast corner, you will pass, you go through from my office, five more offices, and then the Deputy Attorney General's office. Seven offices in total, 80 feet, 70 feet, something like that, not but approximately. If I could take you back in time, we could go back to 19, say, 70, approximately 1969 to 1972, and if we could all walk that hallway together and pop our heads in on the seven offices that are up and down that hallway, you would pop your head in and say hello to two Missouri Attorney Generals, two Missouri Governors, three United States Senators, one Ambassador to the United Nations, one Attorney General of the United States of America, and one Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Seventy feet, seven offices, three years. Because you would start in my predecessor's office, you'd start in Jack Danforth's office. And you walk about 25 feet, and you come to a nice sized room that back then housed three individuals. It was a group office. And you would see a 29 year old John Ashcroft sitting across a partner's desk, literally sitting at the same block of wood. 29 year old John Ashcroft sitting across from 31 year old Clarence Thomas. And then you'd go another 10 feet, and you'd see one of the most accomplished politicians this state has ever produced, perhaps the most, uh, with the exception perhaps of President Truman. And that would be Kit Bond, two term governor, four term U.S. senator, at 29, 28 years old, running the consumer division of the Attorney General's office. And those are just some of the leading names. Now, I mentioned at the outset that I had left the majority party and joined the minority party. And, and so I don't say that I agree with the philosophy that any of those individuals might have on every business day of the week. But none of us can argue with the brain power that Jack Danforth put together back when he was Attorney General. It was an incredible place. And, you know, he'll forgive somebody. I mean, I'm 50 now, but he'll forgive me for, at the age of 24, being sort of inspired by the place. And there are a lot of lesser known names that are have had an incredible impact on the legal profession in the state. It may not be as familiar as those names are, but all who come out of this Attorney General's office. So it's a fantastic place to, uh, to be associated with, and I love the 400 people I get to work with. And if I could introduce them to you, you'd find that they are committed and that they make Missouri a better place because of the public service that they do every day. So, let me touch on a few issues now, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions. There are two kinds of issues that we deal with in Jefferson City and my life. Hard issues and really, really hard issues. The hard issues, I don't really talk about when we're here because these are the kind of issues you just expect me to do well. The administration, of, there's another death penalty on next Tuesday night. Uh, there is a landfill in North County. It's not as big a deal over here, but over in North County, St. Louis, it's a really big deal. There's a landfill, an old quarry, a quarry, a giant quarry that is filled up with trash 30 stories tall. It's, it's down, from uh, ground level down. It goes down 30 stories. It's full of trash. And it is on fire at the 18th floor. So you go down 180 feet, 130 feet, and it's on fire. And figuring out a way to put that out and to deal with the extraordinarily noxious odors that are affecting business and people can't sell their houses up by the airport in St. Louis. These are the types of issues that we work on every day. Those are the hard issues and you just expect me to do those well and I don't come out and talk about them because they're more discreet interests. The really, really hard issues I think are the ones that it is incumbent upon officers of the corporation to talk about with you on a regular basis because these are the issues on which you need to make your decisions about which direction you want to take this company as shareholders by your folks. And the, the issues are exactly the same whether a Democrat or Republican is dealing on them. The answers might be different, but the issues aren't different. Anybody who is Attorney General, Governor, is going to be facing exactly the same issues. What are these issues? And, that's, and then we'll open up the questions.
These issues are economic development for the state of Missouri. The state of Missouri grew by eight tenths of one percent in 2013. We were 45th in the country. 45 states grew, 44 states grew faster than we are, we, than we did, including both the state of Kansas and the state of Illinois. Our revenue increase in the state was only 0.2 percent. One percent is a hundred million dollars, so 0.2 percent, one fifth of that, 20 million dollars, I guess. Finding a way to restart the economic engine of this state and come out of the, this Great Depression with more energy than we are emerging from it is probably job number one that the government will be working on for the next decade. Second issue, public education. There are the two, there are a number of provisionally accredited and unaccredited school districts in the state. The two largest school districts in the state, St. Louis City and St. Louis County, or uh, St. Louis City and Kansas City, are both provisionally accredited. The challenge here is that the way we score these districts, when we rescore them again next August, we just completed the scoring, it is highly likely, people don't like to talk about it, and I don't hear it talked about a lot, but it is highly likely that both St. Louis and Kansas City, because we have a three-year trailing average on different metrics, it is highly likely that both of those districts will probably slip back into unaccredited status in August of 2015. And finding a way to bring success and to scale excellence back into these two school districts is, along with economic development, the most critical question that faces government. And what are the strategies to do that? And how do we recognize and admit the fact that no public school district in the country that has ever, no large scale urban public school district in the country that has ever failed has been able to rebuild itself of its own energy. Houston, New Orleans, New York, Boston, major cities like this that have fallen into a failed status have all had to reach outside of the traditional public school district system in order to build themselves back. And how do we recognize that if we come to a common consensus on that? And where do we go to find those? opportunities of excellence, outstanding char charter schools that are having big effects. How do we come to an agreement that we're going to use these entities to build back these two school districts and then by extension the surrounding school districts that actually some of which are in failed status right now. So economic development, public education, Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion continues to be a controversial issue in Jefferson City, although I don't perceive it as a controversial issue around the state. Those, the fact that most every chamber of commerce, is this uh, chamber taking a position on it? Most every chamber of commerce, let me go farther, most every chamber of commerce that I know of that has taken a position on Medicaid expansion is a proponent of Medicaid expansion. So this is not, we're not talking about the health, uh, healthcare community, we're not talking about the hospital association, we're talking about conservative organizations that are business minded in their approach to community affairs, all of whom think that Medicaid expansion is a good idea. You might approach the problem from the healthcare side and recognize that there are 300,000 of our fellow citizens who are scratching their heads and saying, if I made 133%, if my family made 133% of the federal poverty level, then I would be able to go get insurance on the exchange and get federal subsidies. But because I am poor, I get nothing. And I would imagine that that leaves a lot of people, approximately 300,000 people, with a lot of confusion as to why the political community thinks that that is a responsible path. You could also look at it from the economic development perspective. The two parties have different moral clocks about what is the right way forward, and so I don't spend a lot of time, having been a member of both political parties, I find that trying to say that one, one person's moral clock is better than another person's moral clock is largely a waste of everybody's time. So I approach the Medicaid problem from a platform that I think all of us can agree upon, which is the need for economic development in the state. And so let me approach the problem there. The federal government has placed a $2 billion check in the state of Missouri's mailbox. It's out there on the street. It's out there if we want to go get it. But 
the political community has decided that they're not going to send anybody out to the mailbox. They're just going to leave an uncashed $2 billion check out there. If we were to bring that check in and deposit it, and mind you that we are already taxing ourselves $1.8 billion and sending it out to Washington, so we're already at net minus $2 billion. If we were to bring the $2 billion back into the community, it would mean an additional 24,000 jobs in the healthcare field, so high capacity jobs. It would mean about a point and a half on our unemployment rate, which is still up above 6%. A point and a half is 24,000 jobs. More than that, it would mean a 1%, a full 1% jump in our gross domestic product, our gross state product production. 1% growth, a jump in our economy. Because the state of Missouri has about a $250 billion economy, so $2 billion is about 1% of that. And I mentioned at the outset that we grew at 0.8% last year. So if you add another $2 billion in, it, it pretty much automatically, just by mathematics, takes you from 0.8% to about 2%. And so the political system has made a very conscious decision to cut the state's growth rate to a point that we are 45th in the country. Now I'm going to inject the one partisan thing that I I usually try to avoid partisan uh, statements, but I'm going to inject the one partisan thing that I think is fair. If it was the Democratic Party in Jefferson City that was artificially holding the growth of this state down from 2% to 0.8%, I'm pretty certain that there would be pitchforks and fire outside my apartment window in Jefferson City. This is a major economic decision that we are making that I think has real economic detriment to our state, completely absent of whatever you think about health care and humanitarian issues, simply on the economy. And the Department of Health and Human Services, there's some portion of the room, I'm sure, 40 people in this room who are saying, but well, what if the federal government breaks their promise and makes us pay more than the $1 to $10 ratio that they expect us to participate in Medicaid expansion. To which I tell folks that the Department of Human Services, Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. has for years now promised that they will enter a contract with us. That if the federal government ever breaks the 10 to 1 ratio, that we can go back to where we are today. We put $6 billion right now of our money into a health care system on a 30-70 split, where we pay 30 cents and the federal government pay, pay 70 cents. Now we're being offered 90 cents for 10 cents, and we're saying, no, that's too expensive. And we are paying an economic price. So the economic development, public uh, education, Medicaid expansion. Let me have one more. <coughs> cigarette tax. I'm not in favor of seeing the tax base of this state increase. We have always been a low tax, low regulation state with a AAA bond rating, and that is imperative that we maintain it. But there is one exception that I make to that uh, to that broad statement, and that is the cigarette tax. Missouri has the lowest cigarette tax in the country. Uh, if we doubled our cigarette tax, we would still have the lowest cigarette tax in the country. We collect through the cigarette tax. The Carolinas, where that are tobacco producing states, and one would think would have a low cigarette tax, or like four or five times what our cigarette tax is. A long time ago, our cigarette tax got swept up with the beer tax, and because everybody understands why we have a low beer tax in the state, the cigarette, the cigarette company said, I'm going to go stand next to Dan Hatch Bush. We're going to put everything under a sin tax umbrella. And that, this is how this happened. But through the cigarette tax, we, we bring in about $70 million a year. That's how much we bring in through the 17 cents per pack cigarette tax. We pay out, you and I pay out about $500 million. We take in 70, but we pay out $500 million to take care of our fellow citizens who smoke and who are too poor to pay their own health care bills. 
So we pay out $500 million to take care of them. We take in $70 million to cover those expenses. So we are coming out of pocket for other priorities, schools, economic development, blah, 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 to subsidize cigarette smoking in the state of Missouri by $430 million. If we were to go out and raise this, not to the top, just to the middle, if we were to go to the 26th state in the country, from the 50th to the 26th state, we would bring in about $400 million that we could use for priorities that we all believe in and that would actually make ourselves, make this state a better place. <coughs> Early childhood education, filling the hole in the Department of Transportation budget, which is becoming a gaping hole that has to be addressed. We just decided not to address it the other day, in August. Amendment 7 was on the ballot. But that doesn't make the deficit go away. Or for economic development. And I think that the, I think if we could put it, if we could agree to put this revenue towards something that was meaningful and moved our state forward, that we could find an agreement to pass this tax in our state. So let me close simply by saying that I think, as far as I can tell, I'm the only individual in this state who has served in the leadership of both political parties. You might think that's a good thing, you might think it's a bad thing, I don't know. But for 14 years, I was back with Turnbow, didn't we? Uh, for 14 years at Cass County and then in the state senate, um, I was a member of the Republican Party and I was in leadership in the Republican Senate, elected by my colleagues as the caucus chairman. And for 14 years I traveled around the state and talked with many of the most conservative, business-oriented people of faith in western Missouri and southwest Missouri through the Lincoln Day Circuit, through my work for that period of my life. And I learned a great deal, and it meant a lot to me. In 2007, I made a decision that I'm happy to talk about if somebody wants to talk about it to join the minority party, and for the last seven years I've served as a leader of the Democratic Party. And during that period of time, I have spent my time, much of it, in neighborhoods, with constituency groups, dealing with issues of public health, issues affecting our state's economy that I never dealt with, quite honestly in the first 14 years. And that experience has been incredibly meaningful to me as well. Everybody in this room knows that all of the right answers don't come from one political party or the other. Every single person in this room knows that viscerally in their gut. But the problem is too few people in my profession will come out and say that. I think that the Republican Party has important ideas that need to be expressed, for example, in the realm of public education, just as I believe the Democratic Party, the party that I choose to associate with now, has vitally important things to say in the area of public health. And the goal is to bring more of us together, my friends in the legislature, on both sides of the aisle, recognizing that we are not making progress when one side sits across the table from the other side and says, I'm 100% right, you're 100% wrong. Because we have only these you know, constituency groups to answer to respectively. I, don't, I can't promise that my approach is going to be better. I can only promise this to be better than what we got now. And so, I want to thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to serve in this capacity. I love what I do. And I will be happy to take questions from the room on anything that you want. You are the shareholders of the company, and you deserve to ask tough questions and get them answered. Thank you, everybody. What's the next step for the Attorney General? The Attorney General is really retired. Um, we are, I'm looking uh, strongly at 2016 when Governor Nixon uh, is term limited out. We have, I've made a final, final decision on that, but certainly all of the pieces are being put in place toward that type of decision. 
and, I, and there seems to be general support in the party for that opportunity. Gentlemen, all the way in the back. What is the status of the, and I use this term, so-called right to farm bill? What it, uh, it has. I think the right to farm bill passed by 2,000 votes. I think that there is an electoral challenge on that, that we have a conference call on at 4 o'clock today. So there's a challenge on it. I've seen a lot of electoral challenges go by in the last 20 years. Um, 2,000 votes is a narrow margin when you look at a statewide election, but it is very difficult to turn back 2,000 votes. So my sense is that the likelihood of a successful challenge is certainly less than less than likely. Yes. I, I thought the uh, way that you presented it, uh, Republicans wouldn't go to the mailbox. It's just completely insane, and I have a hard time thinking that those people would be completely insane. What would be their side of it? Um, their side has been the that we cannot that $100 million more to put into public health care in this state is too much. We can't afford it. And that we cannot trust the federal government to break, the not to break their promise on the 10 to 1 match, where 90 cents for every dollar of the $2 billion, 90 cents comes from Washington and 10 cents comes from Jefferson City to take this step. So that I think that would be an, an accurate. And so you're saying that both sides sit across the table from each other and each side right. Do, you, do they have any merit in your mind? I, the, the Affordable Care Act lays out a, a funding plan for Medicaid expansion for individuals up to 133% of the poverty level. Federal government sends in 90, we put in 10. I, I, believe, I believe that. Are there any strings to that 90? Well, we have to expand Medicaid up to 133%. Um, but the there has been no objection to the health care that would be provided. The objection, the core objection has been what if the Congress defunds the Affordable Care Act? Then what do we do? We, we were in Jefferson City in 2005, and we've seen Medicaid cut back in this state, and it's it's an ugly process to go through, but we've done it, we've done it recently, and it could happen again. If the federal government breaks the promise, then our responsibility should be completely reanalyzed. But we can get a contract, and, and the other problem with the 90-10 split is that's the worst case scenario split. Right now, the federal government, there's a $2 billion check in the, uh, in the state's mailbox every year, it has been since the Affordable Care Act was passed, and there's no requirement. We, we don't even have a 10 cent requirement for the first three years, and we have a 5 cent requirement for the second three years. So right now we are not even participating um, to the program, and it doesn't it wouldn't have cost us anything. We would have seen a, a tremendous pickup in healthcare related jobs, and it would not have cost us a dime. When the, when the state government went to bid on the Boeing deal in St. Louis, by the St. Louis airport. We were willing to put up $1.5 billion for maximum of 2,000 jobs. We were willing to pay $75,000 a job to get 2,000 jobs. $75,000 a job for 2,000 jobs. The Affordable Care Act would bring not 2,000 jobs, but 24,000 jobs. So it's 10 times more. 12 times more. And we're not, and, and it would only cost us, worst case scenario, it would cost us $8,300 per job. Not $75,000 per job, but $8,300 per job. So the, the political, forgive me the use of a strong word, the political hypocrisy that says we're going to rush headlong into a special session in order to give Boeing $75,000 a job, you and me are going to give Boeing $75,000 a job, but $8,300 a job for 12 times more? That's too expensive. There was, I, we haven't had a woman's question yet. Yes? As far as that $2 billion check sitting out in the mailbox, there's got to be, federal government can't ask for money. Right, we're, we're being taxed. 
So we're a, a net recipient state. Hey, go ahead. I apologize. If you haven't finished your question. So they are already taxing us. We are is under the new tax structure that comes in under the Affordable Care Act. We are taking 1.85 billion dollars out of the state of Missouri and sending it to Washington. The problem is it's being redistributed to places like Kentucky and the 25 or 26 states, whatever it is these days, that have joined the Affordable Care Act. So our, we're taking almost $2 billion out, we're not getting a dime in return. What do they, what do they want from that $2 billion? They want us to expand um, coverage for, right now we will cover individuals who make, in the Medicaid system, about 19% of the federal poverty level, so about $4,000. You make more than $4,000, you don't get any health care under Medicaid. We want to take that, the federal government is asking us to take it from 19% of federal poverty to 133% of federal poverty. So if FPL is 17.5, something like that, um, take it to from $4,000 to cover people up to about approximately $20,000 which is the level at which, if they make more than that, the exchanges pick them up and they get subsidies through the exchanges. So we've got this donut bowl in the state of Missouri right now. It stops at $4,000, it picks up again at $21,000. And everybody who earns an income in between those two is, is out of luck because of the political disagreement that is going on, largely because of um, President Obama, I think. Other questions? Any other women? Yes. I had the good fortune of dealing with your office with one of my clients uh, this summer. Uh, and it was an insurance fraud situation where the Department of Insurance wasn't you know, doing their job. Uh, and so we needed a little help to kind of help them egg on the situation with your, your office. Um, is there any movement on getting insurance regulation nationwide or are we going to stick to this each state kind of scenario? I think we'll stick with the uh, local decision making model. I, I don't see any uh, movement toward national insurance regulation. And the Affordable Care Act is sort of an exercise in, in that thought process once again. Yes? The last part of the year is a transition from education. You said probably going to be a few thousand kids and Well, specifically, I, I was talking about the issue a little more broadly about in terms of what we as a people uh, need to do to think about public education. Uh, the Attorney General's specific role is we are the lawyers for the Department uh, uh, for the uh, State Board of Education and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So when, when their plans are taken into the court, we go into the court to represent their decision-making process. But that's a very discreet role next to the macro question about how do we solve the public education crisis in, in the state. I, uh, you know, we know a lot more. I've gone down this road yet. Have I joined, Joe? On the, I, uh, I gave, no, no, I want to, I gave this speech this morning, and I just want to make sure that I'm not repeating myself to, 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 at this moment, as opposed to from two hours ago. We know more about public education today than we ever have in the history of public education. The, the metrics that we are gaining from testing and from international testing are showing us the road forward. We know from the PISA exam, which is the international assessment exam, that the, this country, while it was number one in public education after World War II, and for uh, 20 years after World War II, we know that Today, we are 36th in math, not number one. 24th in reading, not number one. 28th in science, not number one anymore. We know that students from these international assessments, we know that students in Poland and in Vietnam are learning more on a year-by-year -year basis than students in Missouri, and in Pennsylvania, and in Florida, and in Massachusetts. Poland and Vietnam are higher on all of these levels, at every single one of those metrics that we are. We know that the state of Missouri still has a 174-day school year, 
when most of the states in the country have a 186-day school year, and where students in Beijing and India have a 220-day school year. We know that most fourth graders in the country can't read their mom. We also know what is working. We know that there's a KIPP school, a, a, a charter school in St. Louis, that is 94% African American, 93% free and reduced lunch. Wonderful discipline, they're in purple shirts, t-shirts, uh, you know, charter school shirts, in their desks at 7.30 in the morning. They're still in their desks at 4.30 or 5 o'clock at night. Their school day is as long as our business day. They de-emphasize sports. They emphasize mathematics. And this school is taking a population of challenged, economically challenged young people who, as a group, are only 19% proficient or advanced in mathematics in the fifth grade, so they are less intellectually accomplished than the average child in the St. Louis Public School District. And by the time they get to the eighth grade, from the fifth grade to the eighth grade, they go from 19% proficient or advanced to like 60% proficient or advanced. And they have surpassed the average school children in the entire state of Missouri, including well-funded districts in all parts of the state. But they have a full day. It's intensive time on task. They go half day on Saturdays, and they go to summer school. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to see if you can tolerate the de-emphasis in sports. And, and the children will tell you, boy, we'd like to play more sports, but they can't, they can't deny that they are learning. So there are centers of excellence that are cropping up in the, uh, across the state. And the question is, how do we scale those up? So that rather than having this kind of success with 210 school children in the city of St. Louis, we can get that number to give the same quality experience to 2,000 school children in St. Louis and Kansas City. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you, when you, going back to the KCPS, yes, um, can you say that it's uh, slated to lose accreditation again in East August? Um, what are, it's what not slated. That's up? not. I, we're not slated. I, I, the way the scoring system works, what the, they were provisionally accredited this past August. My understanding is they barely, they they they've just made it over the line, based on a score that was three years in the past. And when that score trails off on a trailing three-year average on that particular metric, that they would not have made it again. And given where the Given the, this, uh, the challenges that, that they're currently facing, it is difficult to see that a different result occurs uh, in another eight months. But I've interrupted your question. No, I was just saying, I, I am a KCPS parent. My, my children attend Lincoln College Preparatory Academy, which was the only high school in the metropolitan area to receive the Department of Education's Blue Ribbon Award this year. So, and I'm kind of one of those freakishly involved parents. So I'm just kind of curious as to why you, you thought that that was the case and you've made you know, market improvement over the past couple of years. It's, so. a, it's a current scoring system. Okay. You had a question. What was the student's situation in In my mind, I want to say 21, but I don't, don't hold me to that. I don't, I don't recall. <coughs> sure, there are a lot of things that and that is one of those things. Um, but we're not just looking for reasons to, you know, I, I hope your question is intended to indicate that the success of the school is not valid or is not important to learn from just because they might, might or may not have a lower student teacher ratio. I don't know. Thank you very much for your uh, time today.